Greetings, everybody, chess fans, pro chess league fans, and welcome to the highlights of the first week of the 2019 season of the pro chess league. If you didn't get a chance to catch the first 15 hours of exciting live coverage of this event, or if you did catch the first 15 hours and it was so much action that you couldn't keep track of what you'd just seen, here's a quick wrap up for you on what happened in the pro chess league's first week. Um, first of all, before we get into standings, teams, games, anything like that, look here and see some of the names of the people who were playing in this first week. We had number two in the world, Karawana, number three in the world, Mamin Yarov, number four in the world, Dingli Ren making his debut in the Pro Chess League, number six, Vashiel Lagrav making his debut on Twitch with his own stream. I saw him stream his games while watching his teammates' games and playing Puzzle Rush at the same time, um, all in his second language. Um, also, Wesley So and Nakamura, the number two and number three rated American players, were also in action this week. And uh, yeah, tons of strong players were involved. Let's have a look at the teams that came out on top. In the Atlantic Division, um, we had the St. Louis Archbishops rolling out a sick lineup with Fabiano Caruana, the recent world championship challenger and current number two in the world and uh, Wesley So, both in the lineup on boards one and two for the Archbishops. They scored 20.5 points, as did the Chess Bras back in the Pro Chess League after relegation and requalifying 20.5 points, tied for first place with the Archbishops. Other winners were the Webster Windmills from St. Louis, just like the Archbishops, and the New York Marshals, a new qualifying team. Um, continuing on to the Eastern Division, the Mumbai Movers scored 19.5. Moscow Wizards, a new expansion team, also tied for first with 19.5. Another expansion team, the Tbilisi Gentlemen, also winning their first match. And they are tied with the defending professional chess league champion, Armenia Eagles. Uh, switching over to the Central Division, we've got the expansion team again, Barcelona Raptors here in first place with a nice 19.5 points. Basically no team other than St. Louis Archbishops and Montreal Chess Bras managed to score more than uh, 19.5 and points. And um, so the Raptors with 19.5 in an upset win over the Ljubljana Turtles who were a final four team last year. And then the Mosquitoes with maybe a bit of an upset over the Marseille Migraines, who are also a perennial powerhouse in this league. And uh, Baden-Baden, formerly Stockholm Snowballs, with a win, as well as the Norway Gnomes. Magnus Carlsen Liss, but victorious without him. In the Pacific Division, uh, perhaps the team to watch, the Chengdu Pandas, with um, 19.5 points led by Ding Lee Ren in his PCL debut, scoring four points. You'll see him more later in this show. Um, and then the Australia Kangaroos, San Jose Hackers, and Seattle Sluggers, led by Hikaru Nakamura, were other winners in the first week. Um, San Jose Hackers with Mamed Yarov, Shakriar Mamed Yarov, on board one for them. So they've got their own 2,800 player um, leading them. So, um, yeah, keep an eye on the Pandas since they were a Final Four team last year, and now they've added Ding Li Ren. So, you know, good and now probably better. Seems like you add Ding Li Ren to something, a chess team at least, it's got to be better. Um, so, that's it for the standings. Now, let's get into the actual games. So here we have with the white pieces, the newly minted youngest I am in the country, in the U.S., Christopher Yu, playing white against, against Grandmaster Yannick Nuki. Um, and here Nuki in the first round takes his eye off the ball for a moment, develops his queen, connects his rooks, but what square has he forgotten about? The knight comes in and uh, F6 is just weak. Black can't defend himself. The queen's attack, so black must capture the offending knight. Uh, he did. White took back. Bishop takes f6. Bishop takes f6. White recovers the piece and continues to attack. The bishop retreated. 
White plays bishop h4, clearing the way for the queen. Black is going to be mated after something like king h8, queen h6, rook g8, knight g5, rook takes g5, bishop takes g5, and he can't defend queen g7 mate. Or king h8, queen h6, rook g8, knight g5, bishop f5, rook to e8, or something like this. Um, okay. So that's what what that's a quick warm up for you guys to see um, a quick tactic and this is the kind of thing that can happen to you very easily in round one if you are not warmed up. Another player fell to a quick blitzing early attack here. White launches a very normal attack for the Grand Prix attack against the Sicilian with pawn to f5, a pawn sack that aims to get this bishop here and this rook on f1 involved in the game. This is international master Dr. Burger Burger. Taking out 2,700 in FIDE Rapid Chess ratings, Alexiev in the first game as well. Um, takes queen h5, threatening bishop takes e6. So black tries to strike back in the center with d5, blocking out the bishop on c4 effectively. E takes f5, white's threatening pawn takes e6 as well as pawn to f6. So black takes it back. Well... You know what white's going to do, don't you? He's going to sack and open it up. Rook takes knight, threatening mate. Black's got to take it back. Bishop comes out, attacking the queen, making room for the rook. Black blocks with the bishop. Rook comes out. King moves. In this position, the obvious move for white is queen h6 check, attacking the king and the bishop. But strangely, after queen h6 check, bishop back to g7, white doesn't have a way to capture the black queen without losing back his own queen and no obvious way to win material. But white does have... Knight to d6, double axe slam, threatening checkmate on f7. And if the queen would take that offending knight, white would then play queen h6 check when the bishop can no longer retreat to g7 without hanging the queen. So black groveled, defending the checkmate on f7, but after white took on f6, he was just ahead on material and attacking, came in with rook e7 winning the queen, and an easy victory followed. Round 1. Grandmaster Anton Demchenko, 2675 FIDE, playing black against Carissa Yip, 2300 FIDE, um, with the white pieces here. Um, the knight on f4 looks like black's great source of strength. Black is probably feeling very aggressive and strong and in control. He's the man. Here he comes. Carissa retreats her knight to get out of the way of knight takes g2 type tactics and bishop h3 and knight h3 check type tactics. Demchenko's feeling confident, but wait, here comes the knight, threatening knight e4, attacking the queen and bishop, removing the supports of this knight on f4. Demchenko covers knight e4, but there's knight b5, same threat, knight takes bishop, where can the knight go? If it goes to h5, then bishop to g5, queen f5, g4 is going to win something, so the knight goes to e6. Carissa is now the one who's confident. She's calculating. She knows this d5 pawn fork is going to net her material. The knight dodges out, attacking the bishop on c4. But after bishop b5, black still inevitably loses some material. Carissa Yip went on to win a board four versus board one upset. And that is what can happen if you're not warmed up coming into round one, feeling too loose, feeling too confident. Your source of strength, the knight on f4, turns out to be your source of weakness. And a big upset for Carissa Yip there. Moving on, here's a super high quality board four knocking out a board one in round one. Um, it can be hard to recover from this. White's breaking through on the light squares. Black's breaking through on the dark squares. Oh, this light square is even more important. If the king takes, then queen d5 finishes black off with checkmate and one, two moves to follow. So the king moves away and white... Now, okay, black lost a pawn, but what's the follow-up? The follow-up is the back rank, knight to d7, with the simple plan that if the knight trades and white plays queen d7, black won't be able to deal with rook to e8 check, followed by checkmating the black king on the light squares on g8 or g6. So black tries a tactic, queen d3, very tricky. If white trades queens, the pawn attacks white's rook, and so white can't get away with the rook on b8. But white just leaves every single piece hanging, leaves the rook hanging, leaves the knight hanging by not defending her anymore, plays queen to f4. The knight on d7 falls, defending the rook. Yep, saw that coming. Queen sack, hello. Rook comes in if the king moves up. Bishop g6 recovers the queen. And at the end, white recovers the knight and went on to win this endgame. Spectacular. That's a top combination for this first week and from a board four. 
Now, just to show you that even if it's not the first round and people aren't warmed up, there can be insanity anywhere. Here's Wesley So playing just one of the weirdest thing opening maneuvers you're ever going to see. Black here, Wesley So uh, playing against Grandmaster Justin Tan, and he gets his bishop to f1 and 10 moves as black, trapping a rook on h1 sort of unexpectedly. White fires back with his own tactics. Okay. That rook looks trapped too. What is going on here? What knight to b4 if pawn takes? Queen a1 is going to wrap up. So white has to come up with something else. He defends the bishop. Wesley takes it. But the insanity was not done yet. Here the idea is to play queen takes g8 check. Wesley defends it with his rook. White parries that. And it's this weird situation where material seems all equal again. And, uh, but this queen gets trapped where she's been eating. But wait, who else is going to get trapped? The queen is attacked on g1 by the bishop. The pawn in f3 traps the rook on h1. Here, Wesley so invested a bunch of time and figured out that he could trade everything off and win the end game. He sacks his queen back. Everything gets traded, ends up being fancy. And white's intended move knight to g3, trapping the bishop on h1, actually fails against bishop to g5, attacking the knight, lining up with the rook. And Wesley went on to win this endgame quite easily with the bishop pair and the extra pawn. He won a piece two moves later. More insanity at any point here. Grandmaster Iturizaga on 3-0 playing as black against Grandmaster Ilya Nizhnik also on 3-0. Only one of these guys can go a perfect 4 out of 4 in the first week of the 2019 Pro League. Nizhnik may think nothing of recapturing the pawn in A4. What? Black's not going to take on B2, is he? That's a poison pawn. What? Iturizaga takes it. Rook to B1, hitting the queen and the bishop and trapping the queen at the same time, it seems, right? Queen takes bishop on E2. She's trapped. Oh no, the knight's playing hopscotch. Knight d4, or is it checkers? If the rook takes the queen, the knight will come to e2 with check. When the king moves, the knight comes to c3. When the queen moves, the knight comes to b1, and black will have just cleaned up all white's pieces. So instead, Nizhnik resorted to capturing the knight, and what a weird trade this turns out to be. Iturizaga just captures on f3 with his bishop. White can't take back his queen f3. The black queen will get out with, you know, a winning position. So white takes the queen. And somehow, after all of this mess, black has a bishop and two pawns and a rook against the queen. A small material advantage, which Iturizaga came very close to converting. What a brilliant and bizarre madman queen takes b2 to look that deep into it and see that he could get away with all those trades and come out in good shape. But he later blundered, and Nizhnik was the one with the final laugh to go 4-0 and as um, he helped propel the windmills to first place, uh, to their, you know, their first match win. All right, here you see Chef's House, Grandmaster Ding Li Ren with the black pieces, playing a common sort of uh, transposition into a stonewall structure from a queen's gambit, trading, playing f5, and then this part here, this game's not necessarily brilliant. This is just hilarious to me. Here comes Ding. He's saying, well, if I'm going to play the Stonewall, let's just play G5, right? His opponent, Grandmaster Mauricio Flores of the Minnesota Blizzard, is like, I'm not scared. Ding says, I'll huff and I'll puff, plays H5, and Mauricio's like, okay, yeah, I'm scared, and the king starts running away. So that was just pretty hilarious. Um, Ding Li Ren eventually took over a lot of space, cracked open the center instead of the king side, and checkmated white's king. Over here, we've got a couple of the most quality positions left for you from the entire first week. In this position here, Grandmaster Raphael of the Ninja Turtles from Ljubljana, top four, final four competitors last year. He's playing against an IM Alvarez, I want to say his name is, but his nickname here is Peroncio. Um, Black, obviously, very strong and confident on the queen side. White trying to get something going on the king side in time. Queen to h5. Rook takes c2. Okay, black's got something going. This pawn's coming down. The rook's coming down to a2. Queen takes h6. Queen g7 would just be diffused. What can white do? He sacks the bishop on g5. It's the only way. If h takes g5, queen h8. King f7, queen h7, king e8, queen g8 is mate. If pawn takes g5, white also wins. I got to show you guys this. Let's open up an analysis board real quick. 
at the risk of messing up my whole screen cap. Or pawn takes g5, f6, coming into f7, and uh, also threatening queen h6. And one amusing line that we found, f7, knight e2 check, king here, knight f4, trying to block white's control of the f file, but white can just take it, under promote to a knight, capture the queen here, boom, 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 white wins. So back to bishop takes g5 in the actual game. Black doubled rooks on the second rank for counterplay. White takes on f6. Black cashes in for white's queen, but the two rooks eventually found a winning attack against the black king, even after some simplification. Sacks the bishop, and black resigns as this pawn is going to go f7, f8, queens, and win for white. That was clutch. White broke through just in time on that one. Here's one more. Um, Etienne Bacro is playing white for the Marseille migraines against Wouter Spellman of the Mosquitoes. He plays queen b3 check. The point is to get black to move his king away and play knight e6, weakening black's light squares when black has to trade off the bishop. But Spellman surprises him with this incredibly strong pawn sacrifice, just throws his knight under the bus. Now white's the one giving up his bishop for a knight. Here he must realize that knight e6 runs into queen f7, winning that knight on that diagonal to the queen on c4. Um, very hard to play this position for white now after this pawn sack. Uh, Etienne played f4 to be able to back up knight e6 with f5 in case of queen f7, but f4 opened up another diagonal. Queen a7 check, king moves, bishop a6, and his position quickly fell apart. Spillman also beat Vachela Grave to go 4-0 on the day and lead the Amsterdam Mosquitoes to their first match win. And finally, game of the week. Chess bra Eric Hansen has white here against Grandmaster Shabalov, Alexander Shabalov, no stranger to crazy messes. This is a knight orf. English attack that brings Danny back to his glory days. D5, classic break for black. G6, classic break for white. They're each doing what they want to do. White's center is falling apart. Black's king side is getting demolished. This is a good thing to know, guys. Instead of taking on F7 or H7, you often want to follow up with H6. And then, of course, you know, just throw your pieces at him. Knight takes E6. What's going on? Queen C6 hitting more things. Everything's hanging, right? Who knows what's going to happen? Queen to d7, maybe? Nope, not yet. Knight f8 first, knight f3, now queen d7, hitting this bishop. If the queens trade, the rook hits everything. Rook to d8, a counter tactic. If white takes the bishop on e7 or the queen, then rook to d1 spoils his dreams. But of course, white can connect his rooks with a bishop sack on c4. Black can play queen c4 or king f8. Chose to go with king f8. Pawn takes pawn check. If the king takes, then queen e7 check will also pick up the rook as well as mating black in a move. So um, after king h8, queen h7 mate or something. So black takes it with the knight, and now rook takes h7. Eric leaves his queen hanging. It's been hanging for like three moves, right? He's got rook h8, a weird back rank mate with the black king hemmed in by his own pieces. Black had to get rid of the bishop instead, and now check, king here, here, and the bishop can no longer recapture. Uh-oh. Strange situation rises with four minor pieces against the two rooks and minor pieces. Bishop c6, there's just tactics every move here, right? White loses a piece, white gets a piece. Everything comes and goes. But moments later, Eric found a checkmate with basically king e8, queen a8, or king e6, queen b6, and black's position is just death. And if the king moves to g8, you know, queen takes bishop and mate coming soon. So the chess bra scored a huge, massive score, three and a half points for Eric Hansen, four points for Ivan Saric on board one. And that is all the games that we need to see for this week. Now let's quickly see what to expect next week. Um, in the Central Division, you're going to want to keep an eye on the Amsterdam Mosquitoes against the Norway Gnomes, both winning in the first round. In the Pacific Division, none of the teams that won are playing against each other, so I would keep my eyes on the Pandas, a Final Four team last year. And over in the East and the Atlantic, Eastern Division, we've got Armenia Eagles defending champions against Mumbai Movers with a strong, both teams with strong wins in the first round. So watch that match. And um, the Gentlemen and the Wizards, also winners facing off against each other. Meanwhile, in the Atlantic Division, of course, you want to keep your eyes on Fabiano Caruana, Wesley So, 
and uh, they will be facing off against the Webster Windmills, who also won in the first week. So that'll be the match to watch there. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. If you've got any comments, feedback, anything, let us know, and uh, we'll see you for live coverage on Tuesday and uh, probably Thursday this coming week. Yes, Tuesday and Thursday. All right, that's all.